Good evening, and welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. My name is Bill Barabalt. I'm president of the foundation. Thank you to that great band from Yorba Linda High School under the direction of Ben Sargazzi. Thank you. I'd like, to add, I'd like to begin by asking you all to stand for the presentation of colors in our national anthem. Please present the colors. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh. Banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Please be seated. Thank you to the Esperanza High School JROTC cadets and to the soloist Alice Solare O for that very fine rendition. I'd like to take a few minutes to recognize some special guests who are with us today. And they include Jim Cavanaugh, Vice Chairman of the Board of the Nixon Foundation and his wife Esther. Maureen Nunn, a board member of the Nixon Foundation and her husband John. Maureen's mother, Helen Drown, taught school with Pat Nixon at Whittier High School, and the two became lifelong friends. We have many stories involving our directors. Michael Elsey, who's director of the library and my counterpart at the National Archives. Frank Gannon, a Nixon administration staffer and the chief editorial assistant to President Nixon as he wrote his memoirs in San Clemente. Callie Raspi, the Raspi, he, the executive director of the New Majority, and her husband, Mason. Fred Whitaker, chairman of the Orange County Republican Party. Jim and Sharon Goodwin, two great supporters of the Nixon Library and champions of all things Richard Nixon. We also have several guests from Razor, our accounting firm. I always want to keep your accounting firm happy. <laughs> and a special thank you to the many dedicated volunteer docents who are assisting with this event today. They're a very special group. In the spirit of the office of the Second Lady of the United States, I'd like to recognize the legacy of the woman whose name appears across this library and museum. A woman who consistently blazed her own trails to leave a storied and remarkable legacy as someone for all Americans to admire and to emulate, Pat Nixon. Mrs. Nixon essentially created the modern role of the Second Lady and single-handedly turned that role into an important element of the executive branch. When Pat Nixon became the second lady in 1953, she was only expected to fulfill one official position, to preside over the annual Senate Ladies' Luncheon. No one expected the Vice President's wife to actually have her own schedule of events. But the 40-year-old Pat Nixon, with two small children at home, considered it her duty, her privilege, to use the opportunity she had to help her husband and President Eisenhower and the nation. 
She fundamentally created the role of the second lady by setting her own schedule and markedly rejected bland tea and coffee functions in favor of trips to schools, hospitals, orphanages to meet people and promote American goodwill. In Panama, she shocked the officials and endeared herself to the people by insisting on visiting a leper colony there. She was an early advocate, in, even in the 1950s, for the equal representation of women in public positions. She visited 53 countries and traveled over 125,000 miles in eight years. Also in the spirit of the Office of the Second Lady of the United States, today, Mrs. Pence becomes the eighth Second Lady to visit the Nixon Library. To introduce our honored guests this evening, I'd like to introduce another honored guest. Mrs. Esther Kavanaugh is the wife of Dr. James Kavanaugh, who has been Vice Chairman of the Board of the Richard Nixon Foundation since 2016. Jim served on the Domestic Council in the Nixon Administration and as Deputy Chief of Staff in the White House staff of the Ford Administration. Esther Kavanaugh is a longtime friend of the Library and Foundation. She and Jim were guests of Vice President Nelson Rockefeller when number one ob observatory circle at the Washington Naval Observatory, where the Pences now live, was first opened as the Vice President's official residence in 1974. To introduce Mrs. Pence and Charlotte Pence, please welcome Esther Kavanaugh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Bill. My husband, Jim, and I are thrilled to be here at the Nixon Library with the Second Lady and Charlotte Pence, and so many friends of ours, and all of you. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce two wonderfully accomplished women. Today, Karen Pence becomes the eighth Second Lady to visit the Nixon Library. Pat Nixon, Lady Bird Johnson, Judy Agnew, Betty Ford, Barbara Bush, Marilyn Quayle, and Lynn Cheney have all come to Yorba Linda. And like her predecessors, Karen Pence is blazing her own trail and putting her own unique mark on the role of the second lady. <clears throat> Karen Pence is a teacher by trade, and she has always understood and valued the importance of education. She earned both her bachelor's and master's degrees in education at Butler University. Before moving to the Naval Observatory, she served as First Lady of the State of Indiana from 2013 to 2017. She established the Indiana First Lady's Charitable Foundation to provide practical support, including grants and scholarships for organizations and individuals that encourage children, family, and the arts. She now works tirelessly to bring attention to the sacrifices of members of our military and their families, and she is particularly interested in making people aware of the benefits of art therapy to help those with mental health issues. As you can see on every page of Marlon Bundo's Day in the Life of the Vice President, Mrs. Pence is an accomplished and award-winning artist. All the book's charming original watercolors were painted by her. The author of this delightful best-selling book is Charlotte Pence, a re recent graduate of DePaul University who double majored in digital cinema and English. She is interested in film production and creating short films and was involved on campus in the Chi Sigma fraternity. Charlotte traveled to Columbia on a service trip and studied in England at the University of Oxford. She is now an assistant at United Talent Agency in Los Angeles. And as anyone who saw her on The View on Tuesday, she could have a great future in television. Of course, there is only one element missing this evening, and that is Marlon Bundo himself. 
while we wish that he could have joined us on stage today, we will ask Charlotte to give him a special cuddle for all his fans in your Belinda. Charlotte's book makes a wonderful Easter gift for your children and for all the youngsters in the audience with us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce the author and the artist, the Vice President's daughter, Charlotte Pence, and her mom, the Second Lady of the United States, Karen Pence. Thank you very much. Uh, we're doing kind of a, a different format tonight. We hope you enjoy it. Um, we're gonna just kind of tell a story tonight. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. It just means so much when you have a book and people actually come and buy the book. It, it just means a lot. <laughs> uh, and this is our first go round at this. So uh, thank you for being here tonight. We have had so much fun this afternoon uh, touring the library and it is absolutely beautiful. So uh, it's just a privilege to be here and thank you for that great introduction, Esther. That was very sweet. So you're probably wondering how this all started. I mean, writing a bunny book about the life of the vice president. So Charlotte's gonna kind of take it from there. Okay, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. This is really, really cool and really special. It's definitely been um, a dream of mine since I was very, very small to uh, have a book out, especially a children's book, um, especially about an animal, so, and with my dad. So um, it's, it's really fun. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Marlon in general because um, a lot of people ask how long we've had him, how old he is, and when we got him. So I just wanted to introduce you to him a little bit since he is not here tonight. So he's resting. He had a lot of press interviews this week. Um, so, <laughs> so we thought we'd let him rest up. Um, but I got Marlon um, when I was studying in college um, at DePaul University in Chicago. I was studying digital cinema and English, as was said, so um, I, I wrote a short film. Um, and so I had a short film and uh, it needed a bunny in it. Um, and <laughs> a lot of people told me, ch you know, change it, change it to a turtle or something that's like easier to find. I don't know why a turtle would be easier to find than a bunny, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, I thought, no, it really needs to be a bunny. Um, so it was really fate that I was gonna, gonna happen across Marlin. And so uh, I looked online, looked at pet stores and I found him on Craigslist. And um, <laughs> yeah, he's a Craigslist bunny. Um, and he, he um, no price was listed. And so I asked the owner, you know, how much for the bunny? And he said, well, make me an offer. And so it became this godfather joke with my friends. So they said, well, we should name him Marlon Brando. And I said, no, we have to name him Marlon Bundo because got to get that bunny pun in. So um, that's really how Marlon came um, into our family. He lived with me in college, um, in the dorm for only like a week, because that's not actually allowed. But then he lived at home with my parents and then lived um, in my apartment in college. So now he's really a part of our family and uh, he's one of, our, uh, one of our pets. So then lo and behold, uh, you know, we got kind of thrust into this new role uh, after the election and um, we were moving to, to DC, and so of course we had all of our pets with us on Air Force Two. Um, we weren't gonna leave them behind, and some staff people were helping us unload Marlin in his cage. I don't know if some of you saw that picture because it seemed to go viral, and all of a sudden, the bunny was famous, and <laughs> we really didn't really understand why he was so famous, but but that kind of started the whole thing going. 
Yeah, so um, right after the inauguration, actually I think it was on an inauguration day, um, we had moved into the Naval Observatory, which is where Marlon lives now, and my mom and dad live there too. Um, <laughs> that is important. We're just an afterthought now. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we thought, I thought, okay, we, we should get an Instagram handle, just get his name. Um, Marlon Bundo, uh, because I think the Twitter was taken, like somebody took it when he was all over the news that one day. So um, we got the Instagram handle for Marlon, and I remember uh, the first post we put up was Marlon in his little cage um, on our second floor of the Naval Observatory, which is where we live, and um, he hopped out of his cage, and so I put up a post that said, you know, Marlon's first steps in the Naval Observatory. And um, my sister's boyfriend, Dan, actually gets credit for saying he's the BOTUS, and he just came up with that right away. So he's BOTUS, he's Bunny of the United States, and, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's, his, um, that's his official role. And um, yeah, so that's, the Instagram is kind of where it all started, and he got really popular on there. So his first steps in the Naval Observatory, um, that's one thing that we wanted to talk about in the book. And so just to let you know, we keep saying Naval Observatory, but a lot of people don't really know what we're talking about when we say that. Um, in uh, 1974, the first vice president to live in the Naval Observatory was Mondale. Actually, Rockefeller was the first one who could have lived there, but he decided to, he decorated it and entertained there. But every vice president's family since the Mondales have lived at the Naval Observatory. The Naval Observatory actually is a naval base there really is a working observatory right across the street for us. The whole property is 72 acres, but then there are 17 acres that are uh, like gated off where the actual house is where we live. And the Naval Observatory is kind of like a Victorian home is what it looks like. It's on the cover of the book. It has a big wraparound porch. It's very private, right in the middle of Washington, D.C., uh, because there are no tours at the Naval Observatory. So at the White House, there are tours. People come there all the time. But the Naval Observatory is a little more private. Um, now, the way the story got started um, started years and years ago when Charlotte first learned to talk because from the moment she learned how to talk, she became a storyteller. And she would line up her stuffed animals outside, and she would tell them stories, and she would <laughs> regale them with all kinds of adventures. At night, she would tell her little sister stories for her to fall asleep. They shared a room, and really, almost really into high school years, I mean, Audrey would say, tell me a story, Charlotte, I can't fall asleep. And Charlotte would start a story, and then the next night she would continue that story. And so we weren't surprised when she went to college and majored in digital cinema and English because we knew someday this book was going to happen. Yeah, so to get to the book, really, when people ask us, you know, how did you come up with the idea, we always say it all started with Marlon. Um, it really did. It started with this Instagram page. We had no idea, will anyone even follow this <laughs> page about our bunny? How many is he up to now? He has like 27,000 followers, <laughs> which is like way more than me. <laughs> like, what? And I don't even have Instagram. She doesn't even so. have one. So so he's very, he's very popular, but um, I mean, we, it kind of makes, it makes sense to us, because Marlon is so adorable, and he's, he's fun to take pictures of. He has a very real personality. Um, he, he'll follow us around the house when we let him get his exercise outside. Um, we let him, you know, he'll, he'll kind of pose for pictures when we're taking it. Um, people ask us all the time, like, how did you get him to do that? 
Um, how did you get him to, you know, sit in front of the fire or open the book? And he just does that. Like, we don't do anything. He just starts doing it. So he really has a little personality. But it started with the Instagram page. We thought we should do um, a children's book on this. Like, it would be really fun, and it was always really a, a partnership. I feel like it was always going to be my mom did the watercolors. Obviously, she's so talented. So we decided to do it together. And when we wanted to do, um, to pick a theme for the book, it made a lot of sense to me to make it educational. So it wasn't just a story about Marlon, but it also would teach about the role of the vice president. Um, whoever he or she is, every vice president has very specific official duties. And I didn't really even know about a lot of them um, until my dad was vice president. So. Um, that's kind of where it all started, was that we kind of wanted to help kids and adults and teachers and educators, um, you know, have a way to teach about the vice presidency. So we thought, let's just start from the day, the way Marlon's day, if he's following the vice president around, how would his day start? And one of the first things we learned, even before we moved into the Naval Observatory, is that the Naval Observatory, since it is owned by the Navy, um, is actually run by Naval Enlisted Aides. So these are people in the Navy, and they run the house. And actually, their job is food security for the Vice President. So if we go out for pizza, they go with us. They're back in the kitchen. They're making sure the food is safe for us to eat. And so they kind of take care of the house, and we call them the NEAs for short, you know, Naval Enlisted Aides. So when we first came, everybody said, oh, have you met the NEAs? And then we figured out, oh, those are the Naval Enlisted Aides. They don't live at the residence, but they start about 6 a.m., and they stay until we say we're done for the night. So one of the first things in the book when you start reading it is right away, you see the Naval Enlisted Aide's hand holding out a to-go cup of coffee for the Vice President. <laughs> He's got to have that first. That's true. True story. Um, and then, so the next part of the book um, is when Marlon goes on the day with the Vice President. So he goes um, on a typical day in the life of a, a Vice President, but then also of specific to my dad. So the next part is the motorcade, um, which is pretty fun for us because we got to, um, a lot of the pictures were kind of staged for my mom to be able to paint them. And um, one of the Secret Service agents in it is a real Secret Service agent um, who's on, on our team. So it's fun. We have little, little tidbits in there for everybody um, who's close to us to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told Max, I said, Max, you missed your <laughs> chance. You missed your chance in, to be in the book. Um, he wasn't, but, uh, he wasn't there that day. <laughs> you weren't standing by the car when I took the picture. Um, but anyway, so then there, there are places that he goes, and, and I'm going to tell you about what Marlon calls the wonderful EEOB, and that is the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. And if you know people, and I know a lot of people in this room do, uh, who say they work at the White House, chances are they probably work at the EEOB, which is just steps away from the White House, but it's considered part of the White House complex. So people will say, I work at the White House. They might not actually have an office inside the White House building, but if they work at the EEOB, that is considered um, you know, part of the White House. So with the EEOB, um, like that's where my office is, but the vice president also has a ceremonial office there. It's not where he sits and does all of his work, but that's where um, he'll have meetings, uh, he'll have receptions, a lot of the swearing-ins take place there. And so here's just a little inside thing, since you guys were so kind to come out in person tonight. A little tidbit on the page where he's in the, uh, where Marlon is in the ceremonial office, you'll see four sets of feet. And one of those is my other daughter, Audrey. So she's the one in the black sandals. And she helped me when she was home from law school. I said, we've got to go over and get all these pictures. I've got to get these paintings done. 
Another picture in the book that's taken from the EEOB is on the balcony, where Marlon is looking out of the balcony. The vice president's ceremonial office has a balcony, and you can look out and see the Washington Monument. So, um, and actually, true story, Marlon has been to the EEOB. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and the next part of the book um, is another part that was unknown to me before my dad was vice president, um, which is that the vice president is the president of the Senate. So um, the vice president can preside over votes in the Senate um, and can also be a tiebreaker vote. So um, that's kind of cool because my dad has broken nine ties. Think nine. We think it's nine. Um, and we think the, the record is like 13 in a term, so he's broken quite a lot. So that's kind of cool too, because that's specific to him as well. Marlon goes around with him and goes to um, the Senate to, uh, to hang out with him a little bit there. So that's cool. Um, then they, they head back home at the end of the day, and when you go uh, to Washington, D.C., if you're driving down Massachusetts Avenue, you'll see um, this big digital clock, and it has these big red numbers, and that is the Naval Observatory master clock, so it's down to the second, and that is at one of the gates when you enter into uh, the observatory property. And so Marlin sees that, it's getting close to the end of the day, he sees that the clock says 8.10, so he thinks he's gonna get to go play and head to bed, but instead he heads to um, the observatory. And the actual observatory on the property is, is the Navy's working observatory. And uh, just a little aside, um, the vice president, I wasn't home this day, but the day of the eclipse, he actually invited some students uh, in, from DC schools to come over to the observatory to watch the eclipse. So Marlon actually has not been to the observatory yet, but he would like to go. <laughs> um, so then um, another part that I kind of touched on earlier that I really like about this book is that it, sh it does show a personal side to my dad. So um, at the end of the day, um, one of my favorite parts is when Marlon's, again, almost done with the day, <laughs> um, but he hears the ringing of a phone, and so he tugs on my dad's shoelaces um, in the book, um, but in real life, Marlon does actually do that. He'll kind of like, he won't tug on your shoelace, but he'll, he'll nudge um, his nose on your feet, um, especially um, if you're wearing socks. Like, he does that a lot of times in the mornings with people, and so um, in this part of the book, um, my dad goes and answers the phone, and it's President Trump. So that kind of shows also just another true side to, um, to our life and my dad's role. My dad and President Trump have a very close working relationship and talk, obviously, all day, all the time. But they also will talk on the phone frequently at night to kind of wrap up the day. And so that's in the book because Marlon is with him. So um, they talk on the phone, and they kind of debrief about the day. Um, and then the very last part is very specific, um, where my dad uh, has a little prayer with Marlon before bed and like reads his Bible. And um, that's probably my favorite painting in the whole book because it's it's beautiful, but it's it's really it's really sweet, I think. And um, the the Bible is actually open to Jeremiah 29, which Jeremiah 29:11 is a verse um, that's kind of specific to our family, and it's um, we have it on over our mantle. We've kind of had it, I feel like, my whole life. Um, but that's kind of a little a little tidbit too that you can see um, that's not mentioned in the book, but it's in the painting. And then we ended the book with Charlotte did a lot of research and, and put things in the back as resources because she was thinking this is something teachers or parents or caregivers might use to kind of go through actual facts about the vice presidency. And so we wanted to put a couple little fun things in there. There's a little bit about the Bidens in there. Um, you know, each vice presidential family leaves something at the observatory. Um, the quails put in a pool, and we were very grateful for that. 
<laughs> it's a little hard to go to a public pool now. Um, and, but the Bidens, it tells a little bit in the resources what they did uh, to the property, which was very sweet. And then it tells about our bees, too. That's one of the facts. So um, we did add a beehive. We had a beehive at the uh, governor's residence in Indiana. And there is a beehive at the White House. And that's one of the first things I asked when I came was, do we have a beehive? And so now we do have a beehive at the vice president's residence. So Charlotte kind of wrote it kind of cute where she said the, the observatory is now home to over 30,000 bees as well. But I know, uh, Jim, where's Jim? To your, to your right, Mrs. Pence. Oh, there you are, okay. Uh, I know you have some questions. We do, okay. we have some questions from you all this evening. So we are going to ask your questions to Mrs. Pence and to Charlotte, starting with one for Charlotte. Okay. Are any of your other pets jealous of Marlon's fame? Yeah, actually, yes, we have a story about that. So Hazel <laughs> is, our ki is my mom's kitten, and we think she's jealous. Yeah, we think that she's, um, not really dealing with it well. <laughs> she, um, we had a, a film crew over at the house yesterday doing an interview, and, and we were holding Marlon, and they were getting a picture of, of them petting Marlon, and Hazel literally jumped up behind us and, like, walked behind in the shot and, like, got in. <laughs> she was like, I'm here, too. I'm adorable. And she is, but it's about Marlon. <laughs> Well, you talked a little bit about uh, Marlon's relationship with the vice president, so you can confirm for us that Marlon gets along well with the vice president, and the vice president yes. gets along well with Marlon. They're friends, yeah, for sure. <laughs> As co-authors, did the two of you have any creative differences? Do we have what? Creative differences. Um, we, I don't know. We, we worked on it really closely together, because, which is kind of funny, because normally... With children's books, the illustrator is brought in after. Um, so it's kind of fun to be able to work with an illustrator at the same time. So um, there, were, there were some things where I think we, we kind of traded ideas or I would tweak something if my mom was like, okay, well, I can paint this, but I, I can't paint that. So we kind of worked together, but um, for the most part, I think, I think we were on, on the same page, yeah. I, I will tell you one difference, though. It's something we wanted to bring up that we didn't, is um, Charlotte and I both chose charities to give a portion of the proceeds to. And so um, my charities are uh, two art therapy programs that are at children's hospitals, where I, I've been on the board for years and years. And um, one of them is a program for children with cancer. And the other one is in Indianapolis at Riley Hospital, and it's for uh, any child at the at the hospital. And then Char, you wanna talk about yours? Sure, um, so I'm donating um, a portion of the proceeds to A21, um, which stands for Abolishing Human Slavery in the 21st Century. Um, so I think they're great, um, definitely check them out on social media and their, their websites. They um, are all about ending human trafficking, so um, they have offices in 12 countries and two in the US and they basically really um, work to fight human trafficking and to rescue survivors, but then to also help them um, get back on their feet afterwards. So a really um, cool thing and an important thing, I think, is their, their outreach part. So they do a lot um, with education and helping people recognize the signs of human trafficking so they can report it. Um, and they always report when they have survivors that have been rescued, and it's, it's just a really great organization. So um, definitely, yeah, check them out as well. Well, one question that a lot of you wanted to know this evening, has Marlon Bundo met President Trump? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, he has. Um, we had the President and First Lady over for dinner very early on, and we invited them up. You know, we kind of, it's kind of like you live in the uh, apartment above the shop is kind of what it's like, um, because we live upstairs. And um, so when we had them over, we invited them upstairs as well to meet our pets, and they got to meet Marlon. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Pence, you spoke a little bit about um, every a second family being able to add something to the vice president's residence, a little personal touch. Have you added anything besides the beehive? 
Um, well, you know, everybody's done such a great job before me that there really isn't a lot that needs to be done. And just to give you an idea, when, uh, when you live in a home like this, it was the same for us in the governor's residence. There's a private foundation, so we raise money privately for any improvements that we make on the house. And we've had so many generous people say, we want to you know, give money for the residence foundation. And we have to almost just say, we really don't need it. We're, we're really, we really have, everything is great here. But we are, there is one thing that we are getting ready to do. I think in the fall, um, we're going to, there is a little pool house, and we're gonna kind of uh, change that a little bit to make it a guest house, because there's no elevator at the uh, vice president's residence. So, for example, when my mother-in-law comes and stays, um, it, it's a little difficult to climb three flights of stairs up to the guest room. So, we thought, you know, that might be a good thing to have just for the families that come after us as well, to have a place that is handicap accessible. Well, it sounds like that's a worthy one. Charlotte, how did you feel when your dad was selected and then elected as vice president? Yeah, um, how did I feel? I, I, I was really lucky because I was home when they were picked, I guess. Um, it was, and it was really cool because I was just working at a summer camp in Indiana the summer after I graduated from college. And so I got to just be home. And obviously we had no idea that that was gonna happen. And to give you an idea, it's, it's a pretty quick turnaround that you get told that you are being considered um, or you get asked if you wanna be considered for that role and then um, you accept. I mean, it's like a couple weeks. So um, I was there for all of it. So I think that that really helped me because I could kind of see their thought process through the whole thing. Um, so it was, I felt really, I was really felt good about it. I was kind of excited about it and I went on the campaign trail too. So um, that was awesome and I got to meet so many people and um, it's been a real, real blessing, yeah. Another one for Charlotte, who are some women that you look up to other than, of course, the second lady? Oh man, um, some women I look up to. There are a lot of women, um, I, I've been really lucky, there are a lot of women in my life that I've had as professors that, that I kind of go to immediately. Um, a lot of people, I, I studied abroad and, and there were some people um, like in England who I, I still keep in touch with and I'll reach out to for advice on things, um, like philosophy teachers and English teachers who will always kind of send me a note of encouragement, um, even today, even when I have been out of school for a little while. So I would probably say that other than my mom, who was also a teacher in my life, the teachers in my life, for sure. Uh, this is from Mrs. Pence. Pat Nixon also served as second lady. What do you think you can learn from Mrs. Nixon? Well, I love the new video that you have. I got to see that at dinner. and. Um, she had an awful lot of firsts. And I think, um, I think what I learned from that video tonight is that she's someone who took the office of second lady and then first lady and made it her own. And I think that's something that I've learned just in the short time that I've been second lady is that um, you know, you're just there for a little amount of time. And so many times uh, when we're traveling around the country or uh, visiting military families or children in hospitals um, or a, lo a lot of our vets, we have a lot of art therapy programs we're involved in with our vets, just to have the second lady take the time to spend time with them means so much. It's not so much Karen Pence or Pat Nixon or Lynn Cheney or Jill Biden. It's, it's that role. It's, it's while you're in that position to be able to take the time out and spend time with people. And, you know, there were so many great clips of Pat Nixon doing that. And she really uh, did it for the right reasons. I mean, she had a heart for people and she cared about people and, um, that's definitely something I want to emulate. That's a great question. Is there a Marlon Bundo sequel in the works? <laughs> As a nice follow-up to that. 
Um, well, we we hope so. I mean, we definitely. I th think Marlon has a lot more little adventures to go on, and and yeah, we would love to. We'd love to do something for sure. Uh, Mrs. Pence, you recently represented the United States Vice President at the Winter Olympics, and what was that experience like? Uh, it was amazing, really. Uh, uh, it was very very fun to be able to go. Uh, visit the USA house and we surprise the athletes because a lot of times with all the security We can't say where we're going. We just have to kind of show up and it was really fun to walk in and there They all were and and getting to you know, we wanted pictures with them <laughs> More than they wanted pictures with us and that was pretty exciting um, Through the whole Olympic experience. We actually only got to see one event and it was speed skating um, uh, but it was a it was a very it was sobering as well. Um, I mean, right before we went to the opening ceremonies, we met with uh, people who had defected from North Korea, and to hear their stories, it was very, uh, very, very troubling, really, to hear what was going on. So, so the whole thing was uh, quite an experience. Charlotte, now that you are a best-selling author, what are your career aspirations? <laughs> Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I'm definitely, I've always wanted to be a writer, so that's always been the thing that I wanted to be, or I didn't want to tell people I wanted to be that, but I really did. Um, so I think I always be a writer, um, a storyteller as well. Um, I'm really passionate about documentary filmmaking, um, which I kind of got into in college. And, um, yeah, I think I'll always, always be creating in, in some way. So we are live streaming tonight's event on Facebook, and we got a question from Facebook Live. Oh, cool. What kinds of books does the vice president tend to read? Oh. You know what? Honestly, next to his, uh, his side of the bed, he's got about 12 books there right now. So he loves to read biographies. Uh, he loves to read current books about politics uh, written by both sides. Um, he always has a Bible next to his bed. He likes to read the Bible before bed. Um, he also likes fiction, um, you know, so he, he likes, you know, thrillers as well. Uh, they're just kind of books that he can escape into. But he always has about four or five books that he's reading at one time. In fact, on Air Force Two, he has about three or four books that they keep there that he reads on Air Force Two. So I'm not that way. I read one book from the beginning to the end. <laughs> you know, I'm not like him. No, it's like me. Well, we have time tonight for two more questions. The uh, first being, will Marlon Bundo participate in this year's White House Easter egg roll? <laughs> You know, I'm going to answer that one because you don't even know this, but um, actually Mrs. Trump asked us to come and read at the Easter egg roll. Um, but we can't because we're actually going to have a little tiny family vacation. We're going to have everyone together for Easter, and Marlon is going with us. Well, there you have it. You have Our to have the bunny on Easter. Yeah. Our final question this evening is... Uh, Mrs. Pence, what is your favorite thing about being second lady? And Charlotte, uh, what is your favorite about being the second daughter? You know, I, I, uh, I think I kind of answered it before when I said, you know, it's, it's meeting so many people and making a difference in their lives. But really the, the most extraordinary thing that I've gotten to do so far as second lady um, is I was asked in the very beginning of the administration to go... Uh, lead a delegation to the Special Olympics. And I have to tell you, that was unbelievable. Our whole team, we were a small delegation, maybe just five of us. And when we got to walk out with those athletes, it was in Austria, and it was pouring down freezing cold rain, an open stadium. And all of those kids had their arms up, and they were singing, and they didn't care about the rain. And it was so moving. Uh, it's, I don't think anything can really top that. Um, it was just such an experience. You know, um, ESPN was interviewing me as we're walking out, and I start bawling. The guy starts bawling. I mean, we're all just crying because it's so beautiful. It was just so beautiful. Yeah, um, I would say it's it's probably getting to uh, getting to travel and, and meet so many people 
all over the world, but also just all over the country. When I was, I got to go on the campaign trail, it was really, really cool. I mean, I got to go to so many states that I, I hadn't been to. And um, I mean, every venue we went to, every rally, people were just so excited. And um, I don't know, it was it was just really, it's really special to get to, to talk with people. And, and I mean, even being here, this is like so exciting for us um, and for me to like meet people that like the book. Um, so I mean, it's it's really really cool just to get to meet so many people. That's got to be it. Well, we were so happy to have met you tonight. Would you please thank the second lady of the United States and Charlotte Pence.